my original intention uh, uh, tonight was to say something specific to the venue to talk specifically about uh, Steuben and, uh, and, and Valley Forge. And uh, I thought better of it, actually, after a little while, largely because it's the one context in which everybody who knows anything about Steuben knows about Steuben, that he was at Valley Forge. And, and I think, in a way, since he is such an integral part of the, uh, of, of the legend that has uh, come out of Valley Forge, um, that actually does his character a certain amount of disservice because he, um, he comes out of it to a certain extent, I think, as kind of a flat two-dimensional character or almost a caricature of himself. Uh, before, I, before I go on with that, one thing I did want to address early on, just that it's from, especially from speaking people, to people today that became obvious, is, and that's about the proper form and pronunciation of his name. Everybody seems to have a different way of doing it. Um, and American historians tend to refer to him as the Baron von Steuben, which would be the correct German pronunciation. And um, there is something slightly incorrect about that, namely in the sense, first of all, that Baron is not a German title. Um, rather, when, uh, when Scheuben was in Germany, after, well, after 1768 at least, he did have the honorific title of Freiherr, which translates roughly as, uh, as Baron. Uh, but when going to France in 1777, and then later that same year going to the United States, uh, he, he gallicized his name, which was very commonplace, especially among, amongst Prussian officers. After all, French was a, a mark of a learned gentleman, and it was the, uh, it was the preferred language at the Prussian court. Um, and he referred to himself correctly in the, in the French fashion as the Baron de Steuben, uh, changing both the, the title Freiherr and the pronunciation of his name to the French form. So I, the reason I bring that up, um, among other things, is that when I did an article on, on, on Steuben for the uh, uh, for U.S. News and World Report back in July, I had at least a couple of incensed readers take me to task via email uh, for daring to refer to him as the, as the, uh, as the Baron de Steuben. And yet that is the way he referred to himself in, in all of his correspondence. And, and I've yet to find a single document from the period in which he is called the Baron von Steuben. Even the, uh, even the Charles, famous Charles Wilson Peel portrait of, of Steuben, which is very usually titled Frederick William Augustus Baron von Steuben, in Peel's own catalog was called the Baron de Steuben. So a uh, trivial point, perhaps, but uh, just so I don't have purists fuming at me afterwards, I thought it might be important to address it. Uh, but, but it's not just a trivial point, because I, I also think, I think it brings up a point about the, um, uh, the, the Baron's identity and his character, which is really what I'd like to address today, is talk a bit about him as, as a person. Um, he is something of a mystery, and, and uh, he shouldn't be, actually, because uh, although there are some parts of his past that he intentionally kept murky, uh, really the, uh, the, the Baron's background is, is fairly easily documented. It just hasn't been much since uh, his last biography in 1937. Um, because, of the, uh, uh, because largely of his role at Valley Forge, he's generally thought of as this, uh, uh, this, this barrel-chested Prussian who shows up Almost, uh, almost miraculously in February of 1778, and teaches the troops to drill, stomping through the snows and uh, uh, swearing at the at the awkward neophyte soldiers in a mixture of French and German and uh, English curses, punctuated by the occasional goddamn, um, and having his uh, having his uh, aides translate curses for him when he ran out of them. Um, and, and, and as a result, he I, I think to a certain extent he appears almost kind of almost kind of clownish. Um, almost, uh, almost a, a caricature of himself, and he's often too described. In, uh, and this is very commonplace in, in, in current uh, literature on the revolution uh, to, as a fraud. Um, he's he's forgiven that sin uh, of, of self-promotion because he genuinely had talent, um, and the, uh, uh, the the whole reason for a fraud for for being a fraud was simply the fact that he did not have perhaps the credentials that measured up to his talents, um, <clears throat> but. Uh, because he had genuine utility, that, that is really seen really as a, a, more than anything else as something that just makes him endearingly human. Um, but, but this characterization, like most caricatures, I think, just uh, doesn't do the man justice. And uh, really, in, if, if, we, if we look at Steuben's character, we note that he did, was guilty of shameless self-promotion, but this is really a very small part of his character. And a lot of the self-promotion actually came from others, came from his allies rather than from him. Um, he was a man of uh, little or no formal education, um, and yet uh, one of the most literate, well, one of the most literary, I should say, um, uh, figures of the Continental High Command during the Revolution, uh, in some ways with more parallels to, say, somebody like Thomas Jefferson, really a child of the Enlightenment uh, and not, a, not the kind of uh, you know, half-literate Prussian martinet that one might expect him to be. Um, 
he was affable and gregarious. And contemporary accounts uh, constantly talk about what a sociable man he was, how much he uh, loved parties, and he was an elegant dancer, and seemed to make friends with just about everybody. Um, and, and yet at the same time, he seems to be almost incapable of forming an intimate bond with anyone, really very few people. I, in fact, I would say no one, even those closest to him, like his aides, really knew him very well. He, he did not open up to anybody. Um, he was, uh, um, he had a ferocious temper. I mean, there was a famed temper, of course, at Valley Forge, and when, when, uh, when drilling the troops, he found that theatrical outbursts of temper actually endeared the men to him. Uh, but he was a man who actually had a, a ferocious temper and very often over really small things. And Steuben was actually a very difficult man to, uh, to get along with. Um, of course, he's known primarily as a gifted administrator and organizer, and yet he detested both things. Um, he's, he's known for the contributions he made to the army, and not just, just in terms of training, but in terms of organizing the army, and it was something he never wanted to do. It was something that was dumped in his lap, and it's not what he saw as his mission in life, uh, which is something that we'll, we'll get back to. Um, he was very modest about his contributions and, uh, and, and his talents, and he really believed especially after Valley Forge, and he really hadn't accomplished all that much. He saw himself as, as uh, he saw his career as one that stank with failure. Um, but on the other hand, when those things that he did accomplish were not properly acknowledged to his, by his standards, whether with money or with, uh, or with praise, um, he could become very, very over, extremely uh, sensitive to such things and, and sometimes just kind of childish. Um, I, I, I know I sound like I'm, I'm, I'm painting him as being a really unpleasant person, but I, uh, I, I think we can, uh, I think it's easy to identify also with some, uh, some attributes of, of his character. Um, he was seemingly acquisitive in the sense that he always seemed to want money. Um, and of course, as, uh, as some people may know, he was horribly, uh, uh, horribly uh, um, incompetent, really, at managing his own money. As one of his aides put it later after the war, uh, uh, Steuben was and would forever be eating the calf in the cow's belly. Um, he, on the other hand, although he was acquisitive, he was extraordinarily generous with his friends and probably spent more money on helping out friends and aides who were down on their luck than he actually spent on himself. When he did spend on himself, on himself it generally was on clothing. Um, he had a, a really bad habit of liking to buy lots and lots of clothing far beyond his means. Um, and for that matter, when talking about money, he's been oftentimes characterized as a mercenary, as, a, as somebody who came to the United States purely as a, as a job opportunity, and, and, uh, and he did. Uh, he, he came to the United States because he was desperate for, uh, uh, to basically reinvigorate a, a stalled career uh, that had actually ended nearly, well, 14 years before he came to the United States in Prussia. Um, but he still did have uh, a, at least a dedication in principle uh, to the ideas of the American Revolution, even before he was familiar with the specifics of the American Revolution, um, largely because he was very well steeped in the uh, in some of the writings, the political writings of the Enlightenment, the Montesquieu's Spirit of the Law is a very important book in, in terms of the history, the framing of the Declaration of Independence in our Constitution, uh, was one of his favorite works. And he had a, a strong dedication, actually, to representative government, even if he was not familiar with the particulars of the American cause until he was uh, safely on American shores. Um, well, Steuben's uh, European roots are, are sometimes described as being murky, and, and there's really not too much mystery about it. In fact, his upbringing was very typical for somebody of his class. Uh, he was born within what we refer to as the Junker class of Prussia, the lower nobility. Uh, and sometimes there's some misunderstandings about that. There have been uh, more than one author has said that Steuben was not really noble, that he was actually humbly born. Well, uh, humbly born means something different in an in a, uh, 18th century German context than it does in an American context. Yes, he was poor, but his family was indeed of the nobility. The, the Junker class in Prussia was notoriously poor. Uh, many members of the Junker were, were virtually landless, if not entirely landless. Uh, and so his family did not have much in the way of, did not have landed estates, uh, and yet they had noble blood. There's been some debate about, uh, about his paternal grandfather, but recent geneal genealogical work has largely cleared that up and shown that, uh, uh, that his bloodline was purely noble, and in fact, on his paternal grandmother's side was actually somewhat higher ranking, was aristocratic. 